If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to the New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Amen. Amen. We're going to start at verse 12 and read on down to verse 16. Then we're going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 3. Hallelujah. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Whether you find yourself as a young individual or not as young as you used to be individual, nobody wants anybody to despise them. But if you don't want people to have a perspective that you would believe to be false about you or negative about you, all of us have the responsibility to be an example of the believers. God wants all of us to be examples of what a believer is. In word, in conversation or behavior, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. I believe everyone in this room does have a God-given gift, a God-given purpose. Some They may have the call to preach. They may have the call to pastor. They may have the call to evangelize. But if you don't find yourself in those categories, you still have a call. You still have a gift. There has been prophecy that has went over you. There has been laying on of the hands that has gone over you. And so we need to meditate on these things. We need to think on them, dwell on them, consider them, contemplate them. And give ourselves wholly or completely to them. If God has given you a promise, if God has given you a word, he wants you to give great consideration to it and give yourself over to it. So your profiting, your benefit may appear to all. So take heed to yourself. You don't have to be the guard dog of the church And worry about everybody in this room. You do need to worry about yourself. You do need to take care of yourself. You do need to mind your own. But also to the doctrine. If there's something you want to give attention to besides self, give yourself attention to doctrine. We need the doctrine and we need to continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself. How many want to be saved? I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Not only do I want to go to heaven, I want those that hear me to go to heaven. God willing, there is a desire inside of you to be right with God and to be in his presence for all eternity. But I also hope coupled with that is a desire inside of you to see other people saved other people in heaven. I don't want to go to heaven alone. I'm going there to see Jesus, but I hope there's other people that see Jesus along with me. Someone say amen. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 3. We read here in this setting where David, though the anointed king, he is on the run from the present king Saul. And there is contention, there is battle, that David's life is on the line as His best friend Jonathan's father, Saul the king, is doing everything he can to eradicate and destroy David. Even though David has a promise, even though David has an anointing on his life. And he says this to Jonathan, thy father certainly knows that I have found grace in your eyes. And he said, let not Jonathan know this lest he be grieved, but truly as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth. There is but a step between me and death. Here is this young man with a call on his life, with a promise on his life, with an anointing on his life. And though he's in good health, and though he has God's favor, there's only one step between him and death. And that is the status 
of all of us. We have a gift, we have a call, we have an anointing, we have vitality, we have a youthfulness, we have energy, we have vision, we have desire. But between all of us is a step between us and death. At any given moment, on any given day, one step, your next step could be your final step, breathing your last breath. And so I preach to you for the next few moments about the brevity of life. Would you pray with me in the name of Jesus? I thank you for bringing us together as a family of God. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I thank you for it, God. I do not want to take it lightly. I do not want to take it for granted. But God, I want to make much of your grace and much of your mercy. I want to be productive in the Spirit. I want to be productive in the Holy Ghost. And I pray that there would be eternal impact today. I pray, God, something impactful would happen in the realm of eternity. Eternity. I pray in Jesus' name, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Someone say in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm a little weary, a little tired, a little scatterbrained. But the Holy Ghost is going to help us in these next few moments. So thankful for this new chapter in the season of Next Town where we have a morning service in Webster now every Sunday at 9 a.m., and it's been, it's been fantastic to have an open door so far. Every service we've had somebody come, and we are thankful. Today we had new guests, new family, and I'm just super excited, super pumped up. And uh, so just continue to be praying. And then after this service, going to get ready for the evening service in Millbank at 6 o'clock. So I'm a church addict. I'm a church junkie. There's no better way to live life. And so I'm thankful to be a part of the kingdom of God. But do pray for us. There is, there is the fighting, the good fight of faith. And I found that the smaller the town, the bigger the stronghold. And uh, it just seems the past two weeks we've been in a little battle royale in Webster. Something, some spirit there is just not happy. It's very agitated. Last week our sign was cut down. And the week before our sign was cut down. So that's a couple hundred dollars just shredded up, cut up, gone, whatever. And so the devil's not happy, but I'm excited. I, I, I'm not having a pity party. I'm not defeated. I'm not discouraged. The pattern I read about in the book of Acts is every time there's opposition, it means that God is opening up a door of opportunity and a revival is going to take place. And so I thank God. Bring on the opposition with God before us. It doesn't matter what is against us. In Jesus' name, the brevity of life. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. He, he faced a lot of adversity. He faced a lot of persecution. There are many verses we could read concerning that. But what's amazing, though, he was beat multiple times and stoned and left for dead and left shipwrecked out a day and a night in the sea to drown and then left to the, the elements of the earth and carried out in a basket over a wall, escaping for his life. All of these things that none of us, I, from my understanding, have ever faced, he called it a light affliction. If you were to put all the persecution and all the hardships in the scales of him, time, and eternity, he says it's a light affliction. It's just for a moment because there is a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I do not diminish, belittle, or downplay whatever it is that you are facing and going through right now. But if you are determined to go through it with Jesus and the family of God, if you could just put that on the scales, you will discover it is a light affliction. Again, I do not downplay what you are going through. It is very real. It is very consuming of time, energy thought and emotion but if you can ever get back to the glorious presence of God you will realize this is just for a moment after a while it's all going to be over and I'm going to step into eternity and I'm going to see Jesus and I will declare everything has been worth it all I can't escape a statement that I read from my pastor's book Jim Sleeva I shared this maybe last month, I think it was, uh, this excerpt in his book 
where the writer, the author, William Turner, was talking about the parents of Jim Sleva in that generation, the parents of the baby boomer generation, he said, were resilient in the face of challenges and that they were more vividly aware that life was short. He made this statement that keeps reverberating through my mind, and that is, in 1920, the average male in America died by age 53 and a half, slightly less than female. Both men and women were only living a little over 53 years old. I don't know what age you find yourself at, but if you are older than 53 and a half years old, you are living longer than the average person in 1920. But then a hundred years later, we find ourselves in the world we live in, and you can add on over 25 years to that, and the average life expectancy is over 78 years old. Facing life's realities, he makes this statement about that generation that would only live 53 and a half years old on average that they were less likely to prolong or delay their responsibilities. They knew that time was short and life was brief, so they could not wait to turn 30 years old to move out of their parents' basement. They couldn't wait to be 40 years old to stop playing video games. They couldn't wait to be 50 years old before they decided to get a job and work 40 hours a week. This generation knew they did not have much longer to live, so they were going to get involved then and there and make the most of the short life they were giving. I feel very strong in the Holy Ghost that God wants us to have a keen awareness that life is short. Yes, we, if we are blessed to live 25 years longer on average than that generation. But I'm telling you, we are up against a different time clock than a supposed statistic of 25 more years from now. And that is the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back. Jesus Christ is on his way back for the church that he purchased with his very own blood. All you have to do is look at the newspaper, look at your news feed, and day in and day out you see the unfolding of the status of what is going on in the Middle East with the warfare in Israel, in Hamas right now. I'm not saying that is directly connected to Bible prophecy, what is occurring in this very second, but the gist of what is occurring, the culmination of what is happening and how quickly things can transpire lets us know how fast the time clock can begin to move from time into eternity. It is important that we as the people of God are conscious and aware that God wants us to be looking to Israel. Israel, because the signs of the last days, a great part of prophecy has to do with what is happening in Israel. The Bible prophesies that this small geographic territory will be surrounded, not by allies, but will be surrounded by enemies on every side of the border. Just go ahead and look at the geography. Look at the map, and you will not find an ally that is bordered to this nation, and nations bordered order to Israel that are against Israel are in agreement to fight against Israel. The Bible says the day is going to come where the kings of the earth are going to rally against Israel and it's going to look as if it's going to be total destruction for the nation of Israel. But the Bible talks about us lifting up our head and looking up to the sky for redemption is drawing nigh. Jesus Christ is coming back for the church of the living God. God. We must remember that, that there's more to life than just death. Part of life is the reality you may still be alive when Jesus Christ comes back. We read in some times past over the years, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, when the wisdom of this man, this man who had access to anything, was trying to figure out the purpose and meaning of life. 
It's a very depressing book when you read through it. This man has anything at his fingertips. And so he's just finding himself dull and numb to life. And so he begins to give himself over to substance abuse and to see if that can bring some gratification and some peace. But he discovers it does not do that. So he gives him up to he gives himself over to sexual pleasures, nothing being withheld from him. And he discovers that that still does not fulfill the void in which he is trying to fill and piece together. He gives himself over over to riches to acquire as much wealth as he can. And with all the accumulation of wealth, none richer before him and none richer after him, he discovers that all is vanity and vexation of spirit. All the properties that he acquires, all the houses he built, he finds out this reality that I am not guaranteed who's going to own this property after my departure. And so he lost the satisfaction and all the vehicles and all the clothing and all the properties and all the buildings, all the kingdom that he was governing. He gave himself over to wisdom and he said there was no end to it. He gave himself over to insanity and there was no end to it. No matter what side of the spectrum he gave himself over to spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and financially he was greatly discouraged. But there are amazing points of wisdom throughout this book. And one of them is in verse 2. He discovers this. It is better for us to go to the house of mourning. It's better to go and spend your time at funerals than to go to the house of feasting or or going to parties. Because this is the end of all men. And the living will lay it to heart. He's saying it's beneficial for you every now and again to visit a funeral. So you can get this reality. You have an end. You may feel like you are strong. You may feel like you're full of life and energy. But there is an end to this time on earth. He goes on and says in verse 3, Sorrow is better than laughter. Because by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. He says it's better to learn how to have handle sorrow than just having a good time. Because sadness has a refining influence on us. We discussed this some time back where I mentioned the power of a funeral. Where people come together, there may not be much laughter and much joy, but sorrow. A funeral is unlike any other event. It is where people begin to contemplate. It's where they begin to reflect. Because just, just a year ago, they were talking to this person. Just a month ago, they were, they were out to lunch with them. Just a week ago, they held their hand in prayer. Just, just the other day, they, they went to the park together. But now they look at that body. It resembles them, but it just seems like a shell of them. Because life has departed from them. It's in moments like that, that a refined influence takes place upon the human spirit that no other moment can. It's why some people avoid funerals. It's why some people, they'll get under the influence of some sort of substance if they're going to attend a funeral because they do not want to deal with the ramification and the emotion and the contemplation that takes place at a funeral. And so he says in verse 4, this is what a wise person does. A wise person goes to the house of mourning. A wise person goes and thinks a lot about death. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth, only thinking about having a good time. I want you to understand today, I believe the Holy Ghost wants you to understand today that this life is temporary. This life is brief. You only have a few short moments. And so there's a number of occasions in Scripture where under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the writer captures the attitude the Spirit would convey to us today. Psalm 39, verse 4 and 5, Lord... Make me to know my end. God, I pray you make me to know the measure of my days. What it is that I may know how frail I am. 
You might bench press more than anyone else in this room. You may have more money than anyone else in this room. You may be more athletic than anyone else in this room. And you may have higher IQ than anyone else in this room. But God wants you to pull out a measuring stick and realize just like it starts at zero, it has an end. You are coming to an end. And in all your strength, at best, you are frail. Verse 5, behold, you have made my hand, my days as a hand breath. My age is as nothing before you, God. Verily, every man at his best state is all together vanity. Selah, pause. Think about it. I wonder if we can just lift our hands and think about that for a moment right now. I pray that you would be open to the reality that you are not forever on this planet. But your time on this planet has an end. Would you lift your hands and would you begin to ask God to teach you to number your days? Would you lift your voice right now? Psalm 90, verse 8 through 12. You have set our iniquities before thee. Our secret sins is in the light of your countenance. Your personal life is anything but personal or private away from God. God sees everything you do in private. God knows every private thought that you have. God knows every secret moment. You, you can put yourself on private browsing on the internet, but God knows what you're looking at. You can put yourself as a very productive citizen in South Dakota, but God knows the level of productivity or lacking thereof spiritually. God sees it all. For our days are passed away, verse 9, in your wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. Meaning that the typical person in these days of Psalm 90, God would allow to live expectantly to 70 years old. But if they would have strength, if they would have good health, and they would have blessing, they would be allowed to live 80 years. Much hasn't changed even with the advent of science and health and all the things they do to resuscitate us to live. It's still within that window of time, 70 to 80 years, the typical human being finds themselves living. Verse 12, Lord, teach us to number our days so we can apply our hearts to wisdom. God, help me to realize my days are numbered so I can make some wise, emotional, spiritual investments before I breathe my last breath. This is not just an Old Testament concept. But in the New Testament, James, the half-brother of Jesus, in verse 13 through 17 says, Go to now, ye that say today. Today, no, no, or maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll go to such a city. We'll continue there a year and we'll buy and sell and get gain. I, I'm not against structure. I'm not against organization. I'm married to structure in the quite literal sense, and I'm married to organization in the most literal sense. My wife comes as the most uh, highly organized and structured individual. She has put law in order to this vagabond, this, this roaming spirit, if you will. I, I thank God for structure. Don't get me wrong. I'll never forget the words of Aaron Soto when he was helping us in church growth process. He says, you can go out into the abyss of an empty ocean and nothing seems to be there, but sink a vessel and that structure will attract life. That's the power of structure in your life. I would encourage you, if you don't have structure in your home, invite structure into your home. Bring daily devotion into your home. Bring rules and regulations into your home. Bring boundaries into your home and it will attract life. So don't misinterpret what I am saying right now, but there is this reality. 
We are not promised tomorrow. And it is the mentality of my generation as a millennial and those younger than me that they have big vision, big dreams, big plans for their lives. They like to do and accomplish much. They are not short of passion. They are not short of drive, especially those that are mixed into the kingdom of God. But what I have discovered, much of those that have a passion to do something for God are always planning down the road. In five years, I'll start a church. In three years, we're going to reach that city. I just got to raise my budget first, and I got to assemble my team, and, and I got to develop my logo, and, and I got to work on this plan, and I got to develop this speaking skill, and, and I, I, I got to locate a property first, and, and, and we got we to gotta go with this uh, approach, and we got to go with this technique. And I'm telling you, I've heard it time and time again of people that feel a draw to do something great for God but they just sit there at the drawing board the entire time and they never step away from the planning seminar or the planning session or the strategy and just simply put their foot out there and do something about today. It's not always about five or three years from now. Somebody wake up and see what's right in front of you. Today is the day of salvation. James gives the warning in verse 14, you do not know what will be on the morrow. What is your life, sir? What is your life, ma'am? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. If you do not know what a vapor is, this evening, somewhere around 9 o'clock, step outside and just exhale your breath and you will see vapor. And no sooner than you see it, it will be gone. That is you, sir. That is me, ma'am. That is us right now. You think that you have tomorrow. You do not have tomorrow. You think you have next year. Say, you know what? I just, I want to enjoy my marriage right now. I want to enjoy the freedom I have right now. I'll start getting serious about God in five years. I, we'll, we'll get serious about devotion in our home when our kids are teenagers. No, you are missing the window that is set before you right now. Today is the best day to give Jesus Christ everything ha, hallelujah hallelujah so for this this is what we ought to say this is how we ought to think verse 15 if the Lord wills we shall live and do this or that but now our society rejoices and thinks in this way that we could just plan our next revival we could just plan our next church plant we could just plan when I'm going uh, to be given over to the ministry. Well, I'll, I'll plan when our family will be serious about God. Look what he says in verse 15. This, or verse 16. This is, this is not a personality problem. He says, you rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is this side of the Enneagram. Evil. If we live by the schedule, if we plan, and we keep delaying down the road, the, the spirit that is at work, I'm not saying you're possessed by that spirit, but it is an evil spirit delaying the day for you to do what God is calling you to do today. We okay today? So therefore, to him that knows to do good. Well, I've used this verse a hundred times. I love using this verse. But a lot of times we talk and use this verse about personal conviction. But he talks about those that have confidence that they have tomorrow. He says, you know to do good right now and you're not doing it. To you, it is sin. It's a sin for you to think that maybe next year we'll do this. Maybe next year we'll approach that. Maybe next year we'll give ourselves over to prayer. Maybe next year I'll start being consecrated. Maybe next year we'll adjust this in our family life. Let's just, let's just enjoy ourselves right now. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting at verse 1, reading through the New Living Translation all the way down to verse 14. The Bible says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. And by demographic, by statistic, the average age of this church is, is lower than what most average churches are. 
Most average churches aren't growing, they aren't thriving, they aren't having new people added to the church, and they definitely aren't having young people added to the church or young families or children. It's basically, it's, it's the elders holding the fort, paying the bills before the last elder breathes their last breath, and all of a sudden the thing closes up. I thank God that this church is evidence that there is a young generation that is hungry for holiness, hungry for godliness, hungry for morality, that wants to advance the kingdom of God. We are driven to evangelism. We are driven to outreach. We are driven to reach this world in Jesus' name. But don't let the excitement of that youthful vitality cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say life is not pleasant anymore. Because with every day that slips behind you in the past, at some point, There's going to be more yesterdays behind you than there are tomorrows in front of you. There's a point where you cross the threshold. Some people call it over the hill. Some people say it's at 40 years old in which I'm stepping into in a a short few months in March. I will be over the hill. And from that point, statistically, there are more yesterdays behind me than there are tomorrows before me. And so God, teach me to number my days. I don't know how much longer I have. I hope I can live to be 80. I hope I can see grandkids. But still, I don't know if I'll live that long. And I don't know if Jesus will come back before that moment. And so I got to remember my creator. And I got to honor him while I have youthfulness. Before I grow old and life seems to be unpleasant because I am now in the status of regret for all the opportunities I missed. So he says in verse 2, remember him before the light of the sun, the moon, the stars are dim to your old eyes. It's why I'm wearing glasses right now. Before the rain clouds continually darken your sky, remember him before your legs, the guards of your house start to tremble. Before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining members, your servants stop grinding. Before your eyes, the women looking through the window see dimly. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities close. I'm here to tell you in the fear of God, you have so many open doors that are set before you and they are closing. We cannot delay. We cannot wait. We must be aware of how brief time is. Remember him. Because life's opportunities are closing. The sound of work fades. You rise at the first chirping of the birds, but you're not going to hear those birds much longer. The sound will grow faint. You'll buy a hearing aid, but it will have its capacity, and you can hear no longer. Remember him before you become fearful of falling. You worry about danger in the streets before your hair turns white like an almond tree in bloom. You drag along without energy like a dime grasshopper. The caper berry no longer inspires sexual desire. That may be your only obsession but I can assure you this you will grow and come to age where you will no longer operate as you used to and you got to make sure your life is right now. You got things under control right now. You got your body brought under subjection right now. Remember him! Before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Now you're attending people's funerals, but the day is going to come. It's you, sir. It's you, ma'am, in the casket, and you can justify nothing. You've served your time, and it is now over. Yes, remember your creator now while you are young. Before the silver cord of life snaps, the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. For then the dust will return to the earth. The spirit will return to God who gave it. Ah, you stand six feet tall, but you're going to go down. You're going to be brought down. Dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. 
This very body is going to decompose. This very body is going to come to the place of earth and be buried under the ground. We think we have time. We think we can do what we want. We think we can try to be what's trending in society. I want to fit in. I see what she's wearing. I see what he's doing. And uh, maybe I'm going to start dressing like that. I'm going to start acting like that. I, I just, I just, I never had a chance to be like that. And I just, I want to sow some wild. Oats, you can think all you want that you can delay and delay, but one day you will be dust in the ground. You have purpose, you have cause. Ecclesiastes 12 13, the result of this man who is pursuing all things. Some believe to be Solomon who wrote this. I lean towards that, but there's no way to unequivocally know. But this writer, this man, Coming to the closing moments of writing this book, he says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. God will bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so we read what Paul told Timothy, a man of youthfulness. Don't let anyone despise your youth, Timothy. Be an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in you which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the prosperity. Meditate wholly upon these things. Give yourself wholly to them that your profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them for in doing this Thou shalt both save thyself and in them that hear thee. I ask you today, what are you giving yourself to? What are you investing your time in? What are you putting your energy, your emotion, your thoughts, your life into? We all have responsibilities. We all have things that we got to take care of. Yes, as you read in Ecclesiastes and as you read in Proverbs and as you read in the New Testament in the book of Timothy, we have a responsibility to work work a job and to get some income so we can feed ourselves and provide for family if that is applicable to you. We have responsibilities that we are not to to abdicate to another or to avoid. But at the end of all of this, there must be a primary pursuit that is greater than your income, that is greater than your resume, that is greater than your college career, that is greater than anything you can acquire or accumulate. And that is that you have a fear of God and that you obey his commands and you live a life privately that you will not be afraid to stand before God in his presence because you know that you believe he's going to say well done thou good and faithful servant There's some, I feel to say this very strongly we got to put away some childish things right now I, I know that you're an adult I know you're a young adult but you don't need to continue right now trying to resurrect your teenage years that you thought you missed and try to live it up and be popular and be sexy and be attractive and be what is on everybody's mouth talking about. There's somebody in this room, you got to wake up and say, I am not promised the next day. I've got to get my life right with God. I've got to be serious about my faith. I promise you I'm not angry at a single person in this room. I do not have a hot temper right now. I simply feel like a surge of electricity that I best can convey is the zeal of the Lord trying to wake you up. Uh, God wants to wake you up to the life that you are living right now. And if you are not cautious, if you are not intentional, you're going to be 40, then you're going to be 50, then you're going to be 60, then you're going to look back over 
over your life and you're going to realize you wasted three decades and because of those three decades there's total dysfunction there's total turmoil in the trail that follows behind you God wants us to break the cycle of dysfunction so as you go from one decade to the next decade to the next decade you turn around and you see the blessing you see the favor not just before you but it's following you God wants you to have that what do you give yourself to what are you giving yourself to I don't have these verses but if they put them up they can or if you find them in your Bible I believe it's 1 John 2 15 through 17 it says love not this world neither the things that are in this world they that have the love of this world the love of the Father is not in them you I listen to me everyone listen to what I'm saying right now you need to write love of this world on some notepad and bring definition to that because phrases without definition. There's no accountability and there's no conviction. But something inside of you needs to identify what is the love of this world. So he breaks it down into three categories under that. He says it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That is of the world. It's not of the Father. And so now you got three categories to work with. And you need to put some definition to what does it mean, the lust of the eyes? What does it mean, the lust of the flesh? And what does it mean, the pride of life? You want a good example, just follow Hollywood. Look at anything Hollywood is wearing, saying, and doing. And you will find the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And God wants to awaken his church to stop obsessing over figures in media, figures in Hollywood, figures in sports, figures of influence in our community that we think we could be like them. Then we'll be successful. No, the most successful thing you can do is fear God and to keep his commandments and to raise your children in the fear of the Lord when you live a life that way God's favor is there what are you giving yourself to what are you giving yourself to what's taking all your time what's taking all your emotional real estate What's taking all your attention? What's all your interest? What do you think about when you wake up? What do you think about throughout the day? What do you think is the last thought of your mind? What do you think about in your dream world? What is obsessing you? What is consuming you? And God is saying, you have a short amount of time. Wake up. Awaken to righteousness. Awaken to the Lord. The apostles, the Bible says in Acts 6, 4, they figured out the best things they can give themselves to. They said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. If the apostles figured that out, we have the advantage of seeing the benefit of a life given to that. I wonder if you could add a little more time in God's word to your life. I wonder if you could add a little more prayer to your life. You can give yourself to them. But not just the reading of the word, the ministry of the word. Meaning the word that you have studied, that you have ingested, that you have memorized, that you have read, that you have looked at. That you find a way to get it into someone else's life. How can I get this that's affected me into them that are heading lost into all eternity? God help me. To be a minister of the word. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, I will gladly spend and be spent for you. He did not see it as a bad thing to pour himself out into the lives of people that were lost. Acts 15, 26, it says this about them. They were men that hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, in the closing chapter of his traveling ministry in Acts chapter 20, he says, this is all I know. That God is telling me to go to Jerusalem. And I don't know exactly what's going to happen other than the Holy Ghost shows me this in verse 23. Every city there's bonds and affliction that abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. He says, ah, that's not that, that, that rejection that, that attack, that persecution, that is not going to get me off course 
to staying the course of what God's called me to do. Many people make their next decision based upon the consequence or the outcome of what they're going to do and for Jesus. And they, they, they withhold, they withdraw, they pull back. But Paul says, no, I'm going. I, all I know is everywhere I go, I get persecuted. Everywhere I go, I get rejected. But none of those things move me from the direction I'm going. He says it like this in the next chapter, verse 13, when people try to talk him out of going there, when the prophecy went forward that he's going to be martyred. He says, I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says this about the saints in Revelation 12, 11. They overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb in the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. In the New Living Translation, it says, they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Can we lift our hands? I'm just about done. Can you lift your voice with that? Can you pray out loud? Mm. <clears throat> Lift your voice, come on. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's it. <laughs> Teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days. <laughs> Teach me to number my days. Teach me to number my days. Let none of these things move me. Jesus is coming back. I'm, I'm more persuaded than I've ever been. I've, I've heard it for years and years about the return of Jesus. But I believe it with all my heart. God wants you to awaken to a life that is serious about your faith. Stop flirting with the world. Stop trying to sow wild, reap and sow wild oats. Stop trying to resurrect your years as a teenager. Live for God sober-minded right now. We don't know what is ahead of us. I, we don't know how much longer we legally can come together and assemble like we do right now. It just takes one law in motion. Don't believe me? Just go back three years and see what happened in COVID-19. What happened all across it. It didn't take one gunshot to cause people to not come to church and not assemble together. And I'm not saying people that have, you know did health reasons things. I'm not there to judge all that. All I'm saying is legally it doesn't take much at all all to reroute the way society functions we're not promised we'll have another Sunday like this in fact we'll never have another Sunday like this. this is the only Sunday we have just like this this is the only moment that we have and we got to stop delaying our responsibility and delaying our destiny Psalm 71 15 this is what I am determined to do this is what I'm praying I'm like I said I'm, I'm turning 40 maybe that's what's messing with my head my son's a teenager my daughters are on their way I, I keep hearing people tell me enjoy them now enjoy them now they're going to be gone they're going to be gone soon and I, I've went through my phone and I've, I've seen them crawling and, and talking gibberish it seemed like just yesterday living in Clear Lake bringing my son home for the very first time it seems like just yesterday where Grace was brought home to our, our house when we moved here into Watertown it seems like just a, just a vapor, just a hand breath just a, shoot, a few shortened days ago in which Eden was brought into this planet and now I'm turning 40, now I'm married 19 years time it moves it moves it moves it shows no favoritism it shows no favoritism it treats all of you the same the best thing you can do is invest and store your treasures in things in heaven and so I'm praying God my mouth will show forth your righteousness and your salvation all the day because I do not know the numbers thereof. Being I don't know how many days, I'm going to witness 
every day. That's what Psalm 71 15 says. Psalm 71 18. Now also when I'm old and gray headed, oh God, forsake me not until I have showed your strength unto this generation and your power to everyone that has come. I'm more determined to reach the lost and to instill the truth and the doctrine in this generation and the one to come. We got to be doctrinally driven and we got to be eternally driven. God help us. We got to get our hands on the plow and be a part of what God's telling us to do. Psalm 89 47. Remember how short my time is. Redeem the time because the days are evil. Ephesians 5 16. If we can remember the brevity of time, we can redeem the time. And Paul prays in Colossians 4 3 through 6. Pray for us. That God would open a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. That I'm, in, a, that I'm in, a, uh, in bonds. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without. Redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace. Awareness will produce a witness. Psalm 90, 15. Make us glad according to the days where you afflicted us. The years we have seen evil. I speak to those that you may not identify with a youthful spirit. You may be a little past middle age. But the Bible says this in verse 15 of Psalm 90. If you have any regret, if you have any resentment, if you have any self-condemnation, and you don't even have to be 70, 80 to feel this way. You can be 30 and feel this way. You can be 40 and feel like, what have I done with my life? But in the New Living Translation, it unfolds it like this. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. I I feel that verse very strong. And it's not just for those that are older. It's for those that I mentioned that are young adults that feel that you've wasted so much. But God is going to replace the evil years with good because a thousand years in his sight is yesterday and when it is past as a watch in the night be not beloved be not ignorant of this one thing that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is in a day see we think of time the only way we know time is this length 24 hours 60 minutes 365 decade century millennia but God says that's, that's not how the eternal works. You may feel like you spent a thousand years and you've done nothing. But one day with God, he could retro reimburse a thousand years. One day. I have, I have more regrets than I could shake a stick at. When I was lost... And even when I've been saved, and definitely pastoring 17 years, I've missed moments. I've missed opportunities. There's situations I look back, I've played over in my mind over and over and over again. Only if I could have did it this way. Maybe if I could have that moment back. Maybe if I would have did this. Maybe it's easy to live there. But if you could pray as we pray here in Psalm 90 and verse 15. God can replace the evil years with good because in one day, God can restore all the years lost by imparting something that makes an eternal impact that is what reverberates across these prairies. That's what God's about to do. You're, you're one decision away. From making an impact that lasts longer than a lifetime. Because now it's going to affect generations. It's going to affect the future. Joel 2.28, God says, I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. The canker worm. The caterpillar. The palmer worm. Let's stand together.
Hallelujah. Life's short. How old are you? How much longer do you think you have? How much longer do you think you have? We know what the statistics say. If any given moment, anything could happen. Your mortality, and God can make it more increasingly aware. The next phone call, you can realize, God forbid, your mother departs from this earth. God forbid your brother departs from this earth. God forbid your spouse departs from this earth, your child, when things get out of order and someone younger than you dies. Mortality begins to usher in. You realize, man, that could have been me. That should have been me. But God has allowed you to breathe a breath right now to be in this room, to make some decisions that life is short. You're not promised the next few moments. But if you can make the right decision, it's as if God can just usher in the eternal into your life. I pray daily. I pray through the armor of God. I pray the helmet of salvation over our family. I want want my wife saved. I want my kids saved. I want to be saved. I'm praying, God, help me to live in the fear of the Lord. Help me not to have resentment against anyone. Help me, not to, help me not to have, Lord, any gossip in me. Help me not to have any slander in me. Help me not to have any pride in me, God. I, I want to go to heaven. I want my kids to go to heaven, God. Help me to guard them. I pray that I'm very careful what we allow into our home, God. I pray the traffic of our home is very guarded, God. I, we got to pray with the fear of the Lord inside of us. God, is there anything in me that's part of this world, that loves this world? God, is there something inside of me that's trying to store treasures on this earth instead of treasures in heaven. God, is there anything in me, God, where I'm not thinking about eternity? I'm just always thinking about me. I'm just thinking about my own. I'm thinking about my life. And God, when's the last time I witnessed to someone? When's the last time, God, I shared the gospel? When's the last time I did outreach? When's the last time I prayed? When's the last time I fasted? God, search me, search me, search me. I want to go to heaven. Jesus is coming back. Souls are dying. I, I, I feel like I've preached something along these lines multiple times this year, but I cannot shake the reality of eternity. God, help us to realize we are in the 11th hour. What are you putting your time into right now? I know it's quiet. What are you investing your time in? What are you storing up your treasures in? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Have you been baptized in Jesus' name or do you keep delaying that? Have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? If you haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost, you could be filled with the Holy Ghost today. Are you ticked off at somebody in this church? Today is a good day to bury the hatchet. And I'm not talking about in their back. I'm talking about you making things right. Is there anything inside of you right now that says, you know what? I've invested, it was, what was it, just two weeks ago or so, Cole was, was preaching, and he's, I mean, I, I, I didn't have anything like that when I was a teenager, talking about giving up video games to give more time to God. There's multiple other young people in this room, I won't name them to embarrass them, but there's multiple people in this room that are even preteen that have fasted a day, two days, three days in the past two months, this month and last month. I, I don't know if I've ever fasted before as a teenager. But that's the power, parents. I want to remind you and encourage you. The decisions you are making right now, the battle you are going through, there's a trail that's following you. And you're rearing up a generation that's taken on consecration, that's taken on the things of God. I'm determined in the name of Jesus that we're going to do this.